And welcome to another board game breakfast. I don't know what to say, guys. We launched our Kickstarter last week after board game breakfast, and it has gone above and beyond. Not only did we fund, we hit every single stretch goal. We're adding in some extra ones now, but everything, is, I mean, many of the promo packs that we had are sold out. Folks, you have just absolutely amazed me with your generosity and your support of our show and I'm very thankful for that. I had many people who also participated in our contest. Uh, and you can go back to last week's episode and you can find out more about that if you wanna know how to, that contest is still running. And I did not respond to everyone who entered, but if you did enter that contest, I will be announcing the winner for that in two weeks from this one, not next board game breakfast, but the one after that. Today I'll be doing a live Q&A and I believe tomorrow we'll be seeing another one from Sam and from Z. And there's a lot of other exciting things coming out this week, including another board game blunder. But before any of that, let's get started with the news. Okay, a lot of things going on in the news this week. First of all, if you might have missed it, there was a big controversy about the Star Wars Monopoly game. In fact, I reviewed that one months ago, um, and the, considering the fact that one of the, the main character of the new movie, Ray, was not in that game. When I reviewed it, I didn't even know who the characters were, really, at the time, because it was still before the game. They have Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. But Hasbro has now announced that due to um, popular demand, she will be in an upcoming version of the game. So hooray for everyone involved in that one. I mean, it doesn't make sense that she wasn't in it anyway. There's a lot of new games coming out. There's a game called Leo by Leo Colovini, um, but this one looks like it looks like kind of a racing style little game. It, it I I tend to like his simpler style games like this. Hopefully it's fun. Then small versions. We have a small version of Ricochet Robots called Micro Robots. It's based on Ricochet Robots, which is kind of a puzzle style game. We also see Zuloretto Jr. coming. Um, uh, Zool Reto came out in 2007, won the Spiel des Jahres, a great game about building the zoos. This seems to be a smaller version of that. And speaking of that, I'm from Z-Man Games. They're coming out with My First Stone Age, which is a kid's version of Stone Age. Was anyone asking for that? I mean, I'm not opposed to it. I just seems odd. But I guess we're going to see maybe more and more of the popular games turned into kids' games, which, again, is not a bad thing at all. Z-Man also has announced Archaeology the new expedition which seems like a slight reworking of archaeology the card game this is a card game that phil harding did years ago which i really liked z-man picked it up and this edition looks really great with the new art final fantasy, uh, fantasy flight games has announced galactic ambitions this is the fifth big box expansion for the star wars lcg this one's going to be putting more of an emphasis on leaders on Kickstarter, there's a few things from, there's some more of the Meeple upgrades. Uh, you can get them for, there's all sorts of games, Baseball Highlights, Mice and Mystics, Glass Road. I don't know how many of these that you need. I, I mean, I really like to have Orleans ones in this Kickstarter, which is cool, but the Deluxe Orleans seems to have covered that well enough. I don't mind the Baseball Highlights one and the Mice and Mystics stuff, but we'll see. There's actually several games. Um, Dragon Keeper is a new game that's on Kickstarter right now. The thing that interests me about this one most is just that the box has this three-dimensional look to it. It's, you know, another typical go through and fight and kill dragons fantasy style, but the artwork is gorgeous and this three-dimensional box certainly has me interested. Then Gob 2 Heroes. This is where goblins become the heroes. Um, this game seems to be doing pretty well, although it does look like there's the miniatures are very, very nice for this game. So I suspect that there's a possibility that the miniatures are driving the game. But hey, I like the idea of Goblins as Heroes, the very popular webcomic. Goblins takes this same thing. Uh, Pearl has announced an expansion for Deus. Please hang on one moment. <laughs> now, hopefully this expansion comes with beautiful pieces, which the original one was missing. But 
I like they use a lot. It's an expansion for that. It's fun. They're also going to be reprinting uh, Twa, uh, which is a very, very popular game amongst people not named Tom Vassell. Kambach which is a magazine company. They make a magazine about model railroad trains and some other, I think they have like 12 different magazines. They bought rather dashing games. That's made the Dwarven Miner and the Zombies, Robots, Pirate Min Ninja game, things like that. So that's interesting, I guess. A magazine company buying a board game company. Are magazine companies on their way out? Maybe that this is their way of, who knows what that is. That was not the biggest news of the week. I've saved that one to last and that's the fact that Asmodee has bought the worldwide English rights to Catan. Now, Settlers of Catan is probably, other than maybe Monopoly or Trivial Pursuit, one of the world's biggest selling board games ever. I heard rumors about the price of this acquisition, and they are humongous numbers. I know that uh, Asmodee was not the only bidder involved in it. Uh, there was a lot going on there. That's a huge thing. It, it, a couple interesting things. Basically, Asmodee has taken this Catan, um, so it was a Catan, and put it in Catan Studios, and that Catan Studios will be kind of running all things Catan. Catan has been having these giant world record events it's been running every, uh, like Gen Con and Essen, and there's, you know, the game is still being sold with expansions and so on. It will be interesting to see if they up the quality of Catan, because Mayfair is notoriously not well known for their high quality of games. So where does this leave Mayfair? Um... Uh, Catan was not just their biggest seller, but I suspect it was a good chunk of like everything they had. Now they're probably sitting on Scrooge McDuck like piles of cash currently, but they did. Uh, as uh, Mayfair has announced that they will continue, they uh, have some Wallace games are added to their permanent library, like their automobiles and aeroplanes and things and steam and things like that. They also have the majority holding and lookout games, so those games will be part of the library. And they got their original train games, and they got other new games that they're coming out with. But it'd be very interesting to see, will Mayfair still maintain a giant presence at conventions? Um, and if they do, will people be that interesting without the big giant Catan not being there? As will they pick up Catan as yet another uh, feather in their hat? Is it, are they too big now? Are they done? This does leave some questions open. It will be interesting. I mean, just how big is Asmodee's booth going to be at conventions? And these are questions we will find out as the year has gone by. But that, folks, is the news. Let's continue on with the show. Well, we spent the last few weeks summarizing 2015, and then we had a blooper reel. Then we had an introspective on a perfect calendar, which exists only in the Forgotten Realms. But now it's time to look to the future. What does 2016 hold for all of us, Board Game Breakfast, and Wikipedia Nation? I would like to make it to a board game convention again this year. However, with 2016 being an election year and the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, I think my convention going time might already be spoken for. I would like to finally play Legends of Andor after having purchased it two years ago and left it kind of on my shelf of shame. I would like to play another member of the Dice Tower Network on Board Game Arena and broadcast it for all of you to see. I would like to develop a card game sequel to No Thanks called Yes Please. I would also like to finish my game Stonehenge Revenge. And I would also like to develop a Euro game based on the TV show The Office so that I could finally use my prison mic meeples for something. I would like to more frequently use that quote from Mazes and Monsters, where Tom Hanks says, Game? Game? I would like to play Puerto Rico in Puerto Rico. Yet, by the same token, I have no desire to play San Juan in San Juan. I would like to teach a dog how to play Monopoly. And most importantly, in 2016, I am going to do my top 100 games of all time for the Dice Tower. Yes, that's right. Tom put it as a stretch goal on our Kickstarter, which you all helped us blast right through. I'm flattered that Tom asked me to do this, and I appreciate the help and support of all of you, especially my friend on Twitter. We'll talk about this more next week, but for now, accept my humble thanks. Today we're going to take a look at Dice Towers, because, I mean, that's what's important, right? Dice Towers. This is one of the Dice Towers that we have in our Kickstarter currently. This is from eRaptor. It's a wooden dice tower that has a clear plate in the front so when you drop dice in, 
you can see them go through, kind of, sort of. Uh, I like it, though, because I like how sturdy it is and it has a good look. And you can get other plates for it. Here's one, for example, E-Raptor has a Cthulhu one, even though my daughter says it looks more like Davy Jones from the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. But I like these. They're nice, they're solid, they're easy, and you can see dice go through them pretty easily. I also want to show you one of our wooden dice towers. This is the 2016 version. Uh, really like it. it. Has you know the different themes on it of the bluffing and things. And so uh, these also these are, this one is also extremely sturdy when you put it together and dice go through it very easily. I like this one in particular because once you're done with the dice, you pick it up and they're right there on the table. So anyway, these are a couple of the dice towers. There's the Litco ones and other ones also. Um, but I just want to show you, these are from E-Raptor, and this one here is made by Blue Panther. Hey everybody, Steve here, and here's your AFR 2-Minute Drill. So 2015 was a very exciting year, lots of great releases, but with a new year, we're looking forward to everything that's coming up in 2016. So immediately, the biggest thing that's coming out, and it should be out, any minute now is there's going to be a app version of Baseball Highlights 2045 from Eagle Griffin Games designed by Mike Fitzgerald and definitely looking forward to getting my hands on the app version and seeing how that comes out and the biggest release that we're looking forward to here at the AFR news desk is History Maker Golf coming out from play.com this is going to build on the History Maker engine that was first utilized in History Maker Baseball and should be a fantastic game that will enable players to do a full golf tournament in a acceptable amount of time and definitely looking forward to that. They put out a pre-order date tentatively of September 5th and it will be released on October 17th. So definitely still a lot of time in development for that game and we'll be looking forward to new updates for that but certainly one of the more exciting updates that we're waiting to see here at the news desk. So what new releases are you looking forward to in 2016? Leave a comment here on the video and we'll keep you updated on the next two minute drill. All right guys, that's all for now. And until next time, get out there, have fun, play games, and I'll see you after further review. I'm Basil here. Jason Levine. And today's question is from Thyrone who says, is a specialized game table, like this one here from Geek Chic, is it worth it? Should you get this if you are a gamer? Now I have one and Jason has one. In yes. fact, you just got yours a couple months ago. Yes, I did. In fact, you said you just used it for the first time, right? Yes, I used it for the first time uh, New Year's week. Um, we uh, played New Year's Day. We played some games on it. For the first time, I got to actually initiate my table, and um, I am very happy. I mean... Well, yeah. Well, well, let's get that away. Obviously, we think they're fantastic, okay? But they're expensive. So, for an average person, should they buy one? If you don't have the money, I would say no. I'm being perfectly honest. If you don't have the money, the tables are like $4,000. So, if you have $4,000 that you could afford the table, it's... It's not just that it's a good table for gaming, but it's also an heirloom piece. It's something that you would pass down to your kids. It's also used as a dining room table when you put the flaps on top. So it's more than just a gaming table. It's You have to look at it as an heirloom piece. If you're gonna buy it, it's an heirloom piece. It's not something that you're buying as on a whim. And so in that regard, if you save the money and you really want it, it's 100% worth the investment, but it is not something that I would recommend to the average person, I would say, Folding plastic tables are just as good for gaming. I played on those for years and had no problem. Yeah, but you don't even need to get a folding plastic table. You could get a nice table, too. And they, they do make cheaper versions that are just a gaming table. But I agree with everything Jason said there, really. Now, I have mine because a good chunk of my life in my job revolves around this. I don't know that I could have justified it other, other than that. I also might justify it if I was planning to use it as my dining table, because it does make a nice one. All right, if I was planning to use it as my dining table and game on it, and I was planning to buy a new dining table anyway, then maybe. 
And even then, you don't have to get all the bells and whistles. You can get more of a bare bones one. Yeah. But they're still pricey. You probably could go to a local carpenter and have him custom build you one. Now, you'd have to figure out the design and all that. That would be a lot more work on your part. But you could probably get one for a very comparable price. And there are cheaper places like BoardGameTables.com and other ones. They're not as nice, but they're very good. And we saw several in Europe that were as good. Yeah. And so I'm hoping to see some of those come. Now, Geek Chic prices just went up. Did they go up? They went up, okay, in they, January of 2016. Know they went up. I, yeah. I didn't realize they went up. I thought that they were doing that new line where they do... Where they're selling like drop ship. The drop ship. So I thought the prices went down. They oh, actually, for those, but the prices for the other ones went up. For the custom ones. I'm assuming they went up because in December they're like, buy a table now because it's about to go up. Anyhow, you really can live with that one. They're nice, they're pretty, and I have a lot of fun with mine, and I'm really glad to have it. But unless you have a lot of money, or gaming is a huge part of your life, or you really need a new dining table and you want to combine it with a gaming table, those are the three situations. For most people, though, go play in someone else's. <laughs> I agree with that. I, I, uh, I love mine though. I love I love the feel of of the um, the felt? velvet. I love the velvet feel when you're playing on it though. I really, I mean, and it's also great for card games and stuff, right? People at my house, the people that came over the other day for New Year's Day, they were like, "This is the most amazing table we've ever played on," and it really is. But you're paying the price for it. It's not cheap. Um, so it's really something you have to think about if you're going to do it. And like I said, it's a big investment, and it is. Something that you have to think of as an heirloom piece and not just a regular old table. All right. Well, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Send us your questions at Dicetower at gmail.com. Previously on German for Board Gamers. That was interesting. In English, the letter C on its own is pronounced like K or S. In German, C never appears on its own. Come on, that's not even a real word. C appears together with K or H, or between S and H. CK is... Quit it! CK is just like the English CK. As for SCH, say it like SH, and you're done. Note that it's never pronounced SK, as in school. Now for the hard part. CH has no analogy in English. Therefore, just think of this. Look for the J in MOJITO, and you'll find the German CH. As an exception, CH at the beginning of a word is like K, unless you're Swiss. And now, as an example for CH, die Macher. Die Macher. This man is not Michael Schacht. His name is Michael Schacht. Michael Schacht. Join me again next time when I talk about... <laughs> Hi, welcome to Painting Miniatures 101. Today we're going to be rating some miniatures from a new game that just came out. And that game is Alien vs. Predator. A very Space Hulk type of game, but let's take a look at the miniatures and see if it's something that's for you. Now I've already opened up the box, but upon opening, you'll see that it comes with some very, very simplified instructions on how to put these together. And it doesn't look like something that would be too complicated to do. But, upon opening up, you'll see that there's a lot of flashing involved. And it's not as easy as it looks, as a lot of it seems to come pretty much complicated, in that you're going to have to put two or three pieces together, as well as a lot of trimming which could be a problem for a beginner. Even on the head pieces here, you'll see there is quite a bit of trim here that you're going to have to do. And if you don't have a good pair of cutting pliers, it will look bulky and out of, out of place. As far as the detail of the actual miniatures, they're very, very, very good and very defined. The real problem comes down to, can you get it trimmed up and is it worth your time to do so? After I got them all together and painted them, a lot of them were okay. The details were really, really great on the models themselves. But the problem was, is the plastic so soft and so flimsy that while painting them, I kind of was left with a vase, even though I glued them on there pretty good. They were very hard to paint because plastic is just very, very soft. So 
I have to rate this as a 5 out of 10. Now to see them be painted in a live playthrough of Alien vs. Predator, go to my channel, Robert Oren, here on YouTube. <laughs> Last week I only got up three reviews and I really want to kind of fix that. I want to have more reviews up. And so this week, I mean, we did the live uh, gaming playthrough last week, which you'll be able to, you can go back and watch all that. But I want to get some more reviews. I don't know how many reviews I'm going to put up this week, but I do know that you're going to see Burgo Brothers go up for sure because I put that off for two weeks. You're also going to see the new Dungeons & Dragons Dice Master set. Um, we're also going to be taking a look at Ninja All-Stars and Voodoo and um, maybe the new Dixit expansion, the Magic the Gathering board game expansion, um, several different games. I have, a, I have 20 in my lineup. I don't know if I'll get 20 reviews up this week. As I said earlier, Board Game Blender is going to be going up this week. And um, there's also our, our regular shows and you can find all that stuff on Dicetower.com. And anyway, let's continue on with the show. Hello, Chaz Marler from... From... Well, that's a heck of a thing. Chaz Marler here, and it's January 11th, which means it's not only Step in a Puddle and Splash Your Friends Day, yeah, look it up, but it's also the start of a brand new year. It's a perfect time to take stock of the contents of one's board game collection, and this year I'm taking a look at how many times each of the games in my collections has actually been played. This seems especially appropriate right now due to several recent story-driven games that have been released, such as Pandemic Legacy, which has, by its own design, limited replayability. Pandemic Legacy is technically limited to between 12 and 24 plays. At that point, its story is over. And yeah, while you could certainly continue playing the game after that, there'd be no mysteries left to discover. So, because of this, some have complained about Pandemic Legacy's apparent lack of replayability. But me, I, I can't help but wonder if these complaints, like those celebrating Step in a Puddle and Splash Your Friends Day, are all wet. Fortunately, this is simple to test. For example, back in late 2012, I started tracking which board games I play and how many days I've played them on BoardGameGeek.com. So, I have a little over three years of historical gameplay data at my disposal. Of course, keep in mind that this is data for just one individual. But let's see how my own play-per-game ratio compares to Pandemic Legacy's limited lifespan. All right, so, of the 248 games on my shelves, five have been played on more than 12 occasions. King of Tokyo, Dominion, the Pathfinder Adventure card game, Uno, and, ironically, Risk Legacy, which is another legacy game, this one limited to just 15 plays. So, if I play Pandemic Legacy at least 12 times, it would put it in the top 98th percentile of my most frequently played games. And that's, that's not bad. And, but again, this is just for me. Perhaps I am an anomaly. So, what about you? What's your average play per game ratio? Let's compare notes in the comments below, and let's see if there's a trend for the average number of play sessions a modern board game really has in our gaming community. Hello, welcome back. Niels here, Soros Brettspiele durchgespielt. Yeah, today, the best and the worst. And what the game? Okay, it's... Oh! Chopstick Dexterity Challenge! My favorite mechanism on Chopstick Dexterity Mega Challenge is by far the fun. What you're doing is you play with three players and your goal is to keep out of the pieces you want out of this bowl with chopsticks like this and bring it uh, into your own bowl like this. 
However, you flip around a tile and now each purple or shrimp symbol has to uh, get into your personal bowl as fast as you can. So everybody starting picking this tiles and put it in here. So like this, that would be all. However, everybody is doing that at the same time and fighting and hacking and bam, and it's getting loud, it's getting messy and uh, everybody is laughing. This game delivers in three minutes. You have a mess on the table. Everybody is screaming, but everybody has a fun time. That is the most funniest game ever I have played in two minutes. The flip side, and you can maybe imagine the flip side is, uh, and this is really a... Uh, a worst part on that game. Let's say you are not good in chopstick skills and you are doing it like this and you never pick out a tile. You are guaranteed losing this game. However, it's not really super bad because you still have fun fighting and hitting these tiles out of the hands. <laughs> please, please, let me know your favorite things on Chopstick Mega Blah 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 Challenge 3000. And maybe if you hate something on this game, please let me know as well. So, my name is Niels, Cyril's Brettspiele, and see you next time when it is again the best and the worst. Bye bye. Hey everyone, Rick here, and I thought I would take about a while to show you around my game room in its current state. Thankfully, I do have a few of the game room essentials, as mentioned in the recent Dice Tower Game Room Essentials video, like some game shelves. These are the IKEA Calyx shelves, and a BoardGameTables.com table with a cover topper, so that'll lift off and there is a recessed gaming area under there. And of course, some painted miniatures on display over here. And I also pieced together this little slice of a friendly local game store display, which I thought was really unique. And of course, some appropriate posters and pictures, like this History of Role-Playing Games poster, which I just love. A couple of my Warhammer Fantasy painted armies. And that about does it, so thank you for giving me a chance to show you around my game room. I have been very blessed to be able to have lived overseas from America and Korea for 10 years. And I've also had the opportunity to go to many other different countries, including China and Japan and Thailand and Malaysia and Germany and just a lot of different countries I've had a chance to go through. And if there's one thing that's interesting when you go through other countries is the culture is very different there. It is not better, it is not worse, it is just different. Now parts of it might be better, I guess, and parts of it might be worse, but usually our tendencies to think something is better or worse is simply just we're going by our baseline. So as a United States citizen, I would go somewhere and say, well, we don't do it this way in America, and we don't do it this way in America, but that's not a correct way to go about going to see the world, and you will have a lot less fun when you do so. Gaming cultures are very similar. There's certainly groups of gaming culture out there. There is the role-playing gaming culture, which is a completely different culture than the board gaming culture, which is different than the Magic the Gathering culture. But even in board game culture itself, there are different kind of subgroups of that. And there's all kinds of blurring, of course, and there's people who are in different groups. And one person might be in role playing on Tuesday night, and on Wednesday night they're here, and Thursday night they're somewhere else. Not a big deal. But I found, I was reading a thread on the internet, I don't remember where the thread was, but someone was talking about how, you know, we were the true gamers. And they were talking about other people as not really real gamers. They're, they're casual gamers at best. Now, I think that's pretty obvious that there are people out there who are what we would call casual gamers. These are people who play a game once in a while, but they will only do so if you ask them to do it, or maybe they don't have much else to do it. And then there are hobbyist gamers, people who are very involved in the hobby in some manner or fashion. However, even they can be different and I think many times as board gamers, we look at ourselves in kind of a hierarchy of these sorts of things. Uh, I'm, I'm someone who likes this style of games, and that's much better than people who like this style of games. I mean, that's okay that they like those games, it's just they're not as in the hobby as we are. Well, that's not quite true. Let's be more specific. There are 
uh, if you watch the Dice Tower, if you watch our show, you probably tend to like a lot of the same games we like in some form or fashion, the games that are behind me. And there are subsets of people who like even more, like, I only like train games, and I only like uh, heavy war simulations, and I only like um, uh, complex Euro games, or I only like games that are three or four hours long of Marathrash style games. Okay, that's fine. But what I'm saying, we like these. And then we'll see some people, and it seems like they get together every week and they play Munchkin or Killer Bunnies. Uh, those guys aren't really hobby gamers. They're just, you know, they're not, they're playing a lesser game. Now, we might not use that terminology, but it really is kind of, sometimes it comes through in our thoughts and our speech patterns that, yeah, it's okay, you guys like those games, but you're not really hobby gamers. And the fact is, is they are hobby gamers. See, I'm, a, I, I, I'm, I'm part of a, a game group, and uh, we meet in different places. One of the places we meet is at the Rock Game Store on Tuesday nights. And I have a bunch of people who come there, and they like to play the games that I like to play. And well, we, we have different tastes and stuff, but there's like 30 of us and we split up and we play games. There are other people there who are also playing Magic the Gathering and other things. And some of those people who play Magic the Gathering will occasionally get together and they'll play games too. Whether it's Munchkin or Monopoly or Scrabble or, you know, Lords of Waterdeep or what have you. And sometimes in my mind I look at them and go, oh, that's, that's cool that even those guys like these games. What do I mean those guys? Well, in my mind I'm like, well, they're not hobbyists. They're just... They just happen to like that game, too. No, they're hobbyists. They're just hobbyists in a different way. And it's a different kind of culture. Now, I got out of Warhammer 40,000 when I played it because I did not like the Warhammer 40,000 culture that came with the game. I didn't like the way that many people acted, although there was plenty of people who were fine people who played Warhammer 40,000. Overall, the culture of it, well, I, I just did not enjoy that much. And I feel that I would feel somewhat similar to Magic the Gathering culture and things. At the same time, even though I'm not completely comfortable and like playing in that kind of culture or playing in a culture where uh, winning is important, you know, like competitive chess, that's not a culture I'm comfortable with, that doesn't mean people who only play chess are not hobbyist gamers, because they are. Or people who all they play is Magic the Gathering, they are hobbyist gamers. People who all they do is play Munchkin are hobbyist gamers. And we start accepting that, I think, that we will then grow the hobby to be bigger and more diverse. I meet someone, oh, you like games? Oh, do you like Puerto Rico? And they're like, no, no, but, but I really like the DC Deck Builder. Hey, well, that's fantastic, man. I, 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 and then we have a common ground. We may be in different hobbyist gamers, but we're all gamers. Hi, everyone. 2016, a new year with lots of new games and hopefully new game apps on the horizon. Last year, I did a wish list for 2015, and it didn't go so well, mainly because I'm 0-3 on my wishes. So my 2016 wish list is basically the same. I still want more solitaire games in app form, and I think last year's Infection Humanity's Last Gasp is proof of how amazing solitaire games could be as apps. So come on, Oniram, come on, Castellian, come on, Friday, bring it on. I still want more Euro-style games in app form. Le Havre in Limport was a standout last year because it's great, but also because it was one of the few Euro-style strategy games released. And I still want the Pathfinder Adventure card game app. Unfortunately, the developer Obsidian has gone a little quiet on this front. Of course, I'd rather wait and have it be great, but waiting is hard. Well, that was boring. I better add a couple new items for this year. I'd love to see more cross-platform online play. iOS, Android, Windows Phone, Steam. Everyone wants to play when and where it's convenient for them. And it seems a shame that friends can't play against each other simply because they bought different phones. Now, this is one of the more challenging features to implement in a game, and I completely understand that. But I also know that it can be done, and it can be done well, thanks to games like Star Realms and Carcassonne. My other wish is that board gaming websites like Yukata.de, Board Game Arena, and Tabletopia become mobile device friendly this year. Uh, these sites are so much fun to play board games on digitally, but they're designed for computers and not for mobile devices. 
Okay, this is a bit of a cheat because Board Game Arena just announced that they've upgraded the whole site to be mobile device friendly. So yay. Uh, but let's hope that this is a trend that continues with these other sites as well. Well, I've got my fingers crossed that my wish list does better this year than it did last year. In the meantime, I'm going to go watch the app stores for the upcoming Suro, Seven Wonders, and Baseball Highlights 2045 apps. Hello there, Board Game Inspector Bob Boxfat here. Today, on Board Game Theatre, we travel back to an iconic place in 19th century American history. A place where gambling and gunfighting were common occurrences. Characters such as Wyatt Earp, Billy the Kid, Annie Oakley, and Wild Bill Hickok played key roles in this time period. Today's game takes us to a small town that is the very image of a classic town in the Wild West. Tiny Epic Westerns is a game by Gameland Games and designed by Scott Owls that places the players in contention over this small town. Players will need to skillfully choose where to send their posse members in order to gain influence and build buildings, as well as fight other players' posse members. My dream pappy, red or snake, he's the greatest gunman in all of the old west. He had other people that were trying to take his position like Denver. Well, nobody's taking my position. I'm coming after you, gambler. I'm your huckleberry. It's your turn. You no good, dirty living chicken guts. All right, let's finish this like men. Then you draw. No, no, you draw. No, you draw. Draw. Well, that's the way it's gonna be, huh? All right. Bonjour, mon ami. Would you like to see a brand new game which is fresh from France? This is Harold by Runes Edition, a card game for two to four players. In the deck, there are six cards, a blacksmith, a warrior, a bard, a navigator, a merchant, and a scout. Each of them has a special power that can be played, and each of them has a different way of scoring, especially at the end of the game. Each player will receive five cards. There'll be a deck of cards to draw from and a little reserve of four cards ready placed out. Each player will choose one of those cards and put it into their village directly in front of them. Then you choose a start player. That player will choose two of their cards. They will play one into the center of the table. This is the royal court. And they will play one into their village. That player can then activate, if they wish, the power on the card that they've just placed in their village. Most of these powers will make you swap cards with cards from your village from another player's, or they will let you turn over cards which make them nothing. Afterwards, players refill their hand by either taking from the reserve or taking blindly from the deck. After the appropriate amount of game rounds have concluded, players will play one more round, this time only playing one card into their village and then they will do final scoring immediately before play turns to the next player. The first part of the scoring is you will score points depending on the number of people in your village. In this case, I have two blacksmiths in my village and there's one blacksmith in the royal court, which means that each one of my blacksmiths is one point. That means nothing. These two bards mean that they are three points each because there are three of them in the royal council. And then I will score the bonus scoring. So in this case, I will score two points for every face down card I have. Here I will score four points if I have more warriors than blacksmiths. Here I will score one point for each merchant that I have. If you're interested in this, look out for it when it reaches your shores. When? Je ne sais pas. Hi, I'm Holly and this is Patchworks. It's a really cool game. Uh, I really like it, particularly because once I made a quilt and you make a quilt in this game, which is really cool. Uh, also, the buttons are blue. Blue is my favorite color. But that is not the only reason why I like this game. It's a really fun, strategic two-player game, which is really hard to find. Uh, if you're going to be playing a strategy game, usually you have to have at least like four players. Um, and I tend to not have that many friends to play good games with. <laughs> 
So uh, in this game, basically you're going around collecting different patches to add to your quilt, because that's what patchworking actually is. You have to try and fill up your whole square. So you have this giant square here, I think it's nine, nine by nine. And uh, any holes that are left in it, you lose points at the end. You have a certain amount of time because as you're playing the game, this is your time board. And it takes time to knit a quilt. So you go around and you decide if you want to waste time by jumping ahead of your opponent, but you get buttons for that. And buttons in this game count as like money, which makes sense because Back in the day when there wasn't money, I'm sure buttons were traded for something. It's just like really fun and it's really quick and easy to learn, but there's also, you have to think about where you're placing things, because once you place it on the quilt, it stays on that quilt. You can't move it around and decide, hey, this piece fits here better, because that wouldn't make it a strategy game. That would just be like, let's play a puzzle. As you're going around, there's also little squares, so if you get ahead of your opponent, you can collect these squares and they'll fill in the holes. So don't get too concerned about making holes. I played this uh, in the cafe last week and, and I lost really badly because I didn't fill in the spaces. I was more concerned about getting buttons. And that's how you play it, super fun. I enjoy it a lot. And you collect buttons. And I'm gonna do that, and then I would take this one. It's an H, because my name's Holly. And that's another episode of Board Game Breakfast. Hey guys, I'm always appreciative of you all watching. For those of you who went and supported us on Kickstarter, once again, that is just mind-blowing, and we're so very thankful for that. I hope that this is a content-filled week for you guys. I have a lot of exciting things and ideas for the future. Uh, we had a lot of different stretch goals, so there's like a live play of Twilight Imperium coming at some point if you try to know when it's coming in 2016, but it is coming. Hey, have a fantastic week playing games and with your families and friends. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.